uh, my talk about designing for content. It's uh, based on uh, a system that I've created uh, that works for me. Uh, and hopefully I'll pass on a few uh, tips for content-centric and content-based design that uh, you can use as well. Uh, a little bit about my philosophy uh, in here. And in the end, we'll distill some of these things down into a kitchen sink style uh, style sheet that we can reuse from project to project. It's the base of, of uh, a lot of mine for all of my projects. Uh, so let's do it. This is me. Uh, I'm David Hickox uh, from Birmingham, Alabama, born and raised. Uh, and I'm a musician and a web designer. I've been uh, building websites since 1999. Uh, when I started, it was, uh, it was four people in a basement, and there were programmers, and then there were designers, and the designers did everything that the programmers didn't do, which is basically all the front end work and all the Photoshop work. So I've always worked with an understanding of code, and I think that's, for me, very important, and, and it informs a lot of what I do and what I can do. Um, I built, uh, designed them, and somewhat built maybe 400 or so websites. Uh, I counted it up a few years ago, but I guess this is a little more. Uh, I have the 10,000 hours in. I uh, wouldn't consider myself an expert, but because uh, but I'm, I'm still learning all the time. But uh, hopefully, I've, you know, I feel like I figured a few things out, and hopefully I can pass those along. Uh, I work with a lot of clients, uh, big and small clients. Uh, international clients, local clients. Uh, I do a lot of work now through uh, Modern Tribe, uh, who develops the, a few plugins that are great, but also has a client services division. Uh, they're hiring. And if you are looking for work, it's a great, great group of people, just a group of freelancers. Uh, my, my story kind of starts with type. Um, I knew from a retardedly young age that I wanted to play music and do what at the time was was uh, commercial art. Uh, I never really had a desire to be an artist, but arty things uh, always always struck a chord with me. Um, and, I, and I gravitated towards type, uh, type-based stuff. Uh, and so when, when I went to college, you know, I did a lot of, uh, a lot of work with type. Printmaking was always awesome because I get to handle metal type and set text and all this stuff. Uh, so it, at some point in my college career, I got an offer for, for a job in this new thing called web design. And I was stoked, you know, oh yeah, I get to really do this art thing and get paid for it. Um, and when I, when I showed up at the job, this was kind of what I had to work on. <laughs> it was really, really disappointing. Uh, we, were, we were building these graphical headers and these graphical sidebar menus and, and a graphical footer, all in Photoshop, flat graphics, and then there was this little wasteland in the middle that, you know, you have to throw some text in and be done. So all this cool stuff I thought I was going to get to do with type of text, out the window. Um, and then, you know, as, as the web grew and as styles changed and, and, and we got a, a little bit uh, more mature with what we we're doing, you know, we had more boxes to fill. Uh, this is kind of a, a standard template for something we might have built five years ago or even today. Logo, menu bar, big hero graphics, and columns and stuff. And our process from those early days never really changed. Uh, it was we would get a project and, and then kind of fill in these boxes with graphic stuff, uh, and present to the client, and. Uh, as a, as a business, the, the agency that I worked for for many years, we kept running into the same problem in designing websites for clients, is that we could do all this stuff, we could fill in all these boxes, but then we would get to the content phase and these, these projects would sit for months and never really launch because the, the content was this afterthought. And that was something we were struggling with, and me as a designer, I kept struggling with the fact that I was in a position to increasingly, you know, when we, when we just had a header and a, and a menu, a lot of those, uh, there, there are some pretty heavy assumptions that I can gather about what needs to be in there. The content is kind of dictated. But when we get into like this sort of area, like I, I'm, it's my job to create a message and to communicate. 
And without that content, it was increasingly hard for me to do a good job. So I stumbled across this wonderful quote from Jeffrey Zeldman that really empowered me to sort of demand a different way of working for my bosses and, and for myself. Uh, and that is, content precedes design. Design in the absence of content is not design, it's just decoration. And so I felt like that resonated with me. I felt like, like for many years I'd just been almost a frame maker, you know? I wasn't really communicating stuff, I was just creating this, this neat little box that, that maybe stuff could go in. Uh, so I tried to consciously start working with content uh, and, and working off actual client content to, to create these messages. Uh, and I developed a way of working uh, that was content first. So let's take the actual content that we're, that we're dealing with and, and build off of that, instead of letting that be the afterthought. And that has a few really great uh, <coughs> benefits. One, make the thing the thing. Uh, people are coming to your website, presumably, or viewing content on the web, to find these chunks of information. Uh, it doesn't have a lot to do with what your navigation looks like or your hero image. Those are ads. You know, Most of those boxes are, when you get down to it, just ads. Um, people are after the kind of stuff that is in a P-tag. Um, and so uh, by working with that and making that the focus, uh, we can sort of amplify that content with the uh, type of presentation that choose. Um, so the second part is using types of voice. Um, one of the things that we did uh, in the earlier days is use a bunch of drop shadows and a bunch of stupid Photoshop effects uh, to create this feeling. Uh, and type inherently has a, has a feeling. It's designed to convey, uh, it's designed to have connotations and associations and convey, convey meaning. Um, and so by choosing appropriate type and making sure it's set correctly, uh, we can infuse that content with meaning and really give it an a amplification to what it's trying to say. Um, so, you know, broad strokes here. Uh, if, you know, the serif versus sans serif, uh, if I were trying to do something very modern, uh, I would obviously use a sans serif. Uh, if I'm trying to do long form content, something that needs to be kind of bookish, uh, I would use a serif. And then those divisions split and split and split. And within those, working with the actual content, you'll find one or maybe two or three, but you'll choose one that says, like, oh, this really feels like what, what this content is trying to say. Um, and the third benefit of this is that you create a simplicity. I have found that once I've set the text and got like a decent, got decent text styles, the rest of the stuff that I have to do uh, it's pretty minimal to make the to make um, the website feel finished. Uh, if you look at book design or magazine design, it's not a lot of crazy different stuff all the time. It's long form text that's set very well uh, with a few things to accent. And so you find I think that that is finally catching on on the web. Sites like Medium, Box does no good job of it. A lot of the magazine sites are getting to where it's just great long form content. And so with this type of system. We can let the text do the talking, uh, the content do the talking for us without having to do a lot of decoration. So, the, uh, getting into my <coughs> system of working, I start from uh, from a kitchen sink style style guide, which is all the H tags, paragraph, table, block quote, uh, ULs, OLs, that kind of thing. And I start with actual content. Uh, this is an interesting article. This is the one that I chosen to illustrate here. Uh, it's about this Swedish solar system that exists in real life in, in Sweden. It's, anyway, uh, this is all up, you can read it, uh, I'll have a link uh, later. But, uh, so this is the example we're using. Um, so step one in, in working this way is finding that voice. Uh, like I said, type has a voice. To use it correctly, uh, you want to operate on a very subliminal level. Um, if if you see the type, you're probably doing it kind of wrong. Uh, but there's there's uh, a, a level at which the type is resonating with the content, but not sticking out, and that's perfect. Uh, this is a great quote. 
Uh, type well uses invisible as type, just as the perfect talking voice is unnoticed vehicle for the transmission of words and ideas. Um, so for most uh, body content, uh, we're looking for something that blends in, but, uh, but also uh, speaks in a way. So for this particular content that I've chosen, uh, I want it to be, to, to find that right voice, uh, I'm going to think about what it needs to be. This particular content uh, is medium long form content. It's somewhat studious, kind of bookish. Uh, so I'm going to choose for the body a serif typeface. I like this one, Serbo, that I found on Typekit. Um, and then I'm going to, uh, since it's kind of a fun article, uh, I'm going to sort of diffuse that, that uh, formality with, with some nice uh, sans serif text as the headers and some of the accents. So my starting point is always one paragraph of text. Uh, I usually do this in code. Uh, you can do it in Photoshop. It's, uh, a little, for some reason, a little bit harder for me um, to do it in Photoshop because changing values is a, is a lot more difficult. Uh, if you work in code, you can change values across the board uh, with one line. And it's just a lot easier for me. Um, but I'm going to start with setting an 18 pixel uh, as a guide uh, text size uh, and, and uh, line height of 28 is up there. Uh, and so where I start is establishing a font size that's text size that's readable. Um, and then line height, spacing that out uh, in a way where, uh, where it's comfortable to read. Uh, and then working with uh, line length, uh, so establishing what what my max width there I want to be, and, and there's a sort of dance that you use uh, with those things to get a decent looking body of, of text. Well, when dealing with line height, we typically uh, a base is about 1.5 uh, as a ratio uh, of font size to line height. Uh, and you'll find typically that with longer lengths, we need a little bit more line height because uh, as we as we go from line to line, uh, it allows us to to follow that trail and not get lost. And you'll find that with shorter things like columns, you need a little bit less of that. It starts to look uh, starts to look like individual items instead of a a uh, block of one block. So I'm going to start in code by setting up this body. I've uh, chosen my font here. I've got a backup of Georgia, which is a similar font that is going to be sorry, available on all, all or most systems. Uh, I use RIMS. Uh, we, as responsive especially, takes hold. Uh, it's important to get rid of the pixel-based mentality, uh, res uh, screen resolution-based mentality, and work a lot more with loose ratios. So. Uh, I find that working with rims is my preferred method. Um, a rim is a root M. Uh, M is an, a, a unit based on the browser's default uh, pixel font size, which is 16. And so uh, as we use M's, it, it inherits every, uh, every container that's in. And it gets really confusing because uh, you, the, the units aren't consistent, so I use root M, which is always uh, asking the body tag or the HTML element uh, which, uh, what that base is. So it's always based on 16 and allows me to do pretty simple ratios. In all this, we're going to try to get to a point where we're dealing with simple ratios. That's, <coughs> good. that's, uh, that's the uh, best way to work here. Uh, I've set my line height to 1.625. The, uh, the line length is a little long there, so I bumped it up a little bit to a, a level that I feel is comfortable. Uh, and then I've used a color that is not black. Uh, pro tip, black on white is really difficult to read. Uh, if you soften that black a little bit, uh, it gets a lot easier on the eyes. Also, black is not a color that exists in nature. It's very unnatural. So. Uh, using something that's a little bit, uh, a little bit softer, usually helps with readability. 
So that, that sets up uh, my body stuff. Everything's going to be built off that. Uh, and starting with the P tag, I'll start working uh, with that first. And really about the only thing I'm going to do there is, is find a, a system of spacing it out. I use bottom, spa bottom spacing on everything because it uh, allows me to be more predict predictable with, uh, with how things are stacked. Uh, I think the default behavior for a paragraph is 1M on top and bottom, uh, but I just shift everything to whole bottom because it, it, it's easier for me to think that way. So my second step is, uh, is spacing out the text. Uh, I've added a couple more paragraphs here so I can start to get that rhythm uh, from paragraph to paragraph. Uh, and this is what it looks like. Awesome. So next step is start adding those headings. And this is, a, this is where we want to get. We want to get to a system with clear headings. Uh, one of the great benefits of web as a format is it's very scannable uh, versus trying to find something in a book or magazine where it involves flipping pages. You can really just flip way down there really fast uh, with the web and find what you're looking for. So it's very important to me to build um, to build in some high contrast with these different headings. Uh, one, to give clients an option uh, of different ways to style stuff, but two, more importantly, to allow for that scannability so I can very quickly, without even having to look at the content, tell where what's a major thought and what is a subset of that major thought. So I try to maximize uh, contrast here. And in setting up uh, this, in setting up these, he these heading systems, um, it's important to use some sort of uh, ratio, some sort of uh, system. And thankfully that's been done for years and years and years back with a metal type. It's an exponential system. Uh, where, where things get bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, this is based on metal type sizes, which uh, you, know, you couldn't get a 71 point text that was only printed in, in these specific units. Um, so with, when the computer comes along and we can put anything in those values in Photoshop, it becomes really confusing uh, to develop this sort of rhythm. So I find using a system similar to this uh, very, very helpful. One of the problems with this is that you'll notice the base font, or the base text size, which is highlighted way down there, is 10 point, which is not really usable if we were to convert that to pixels for the web. 10 pixel base text uh, is pretty much pretty illegible. Um, so what I tend to do is kind of bump that up using the same sort of ratios, same sort of rhythm here, uh, but now you can see what I've used as my base for the content that we're creating today uh, is, is right there in the middle. I've got some great options for, uh, for headings above, and I've got some options below uh, for things like captions or footnotes. So scaling this up uh, for, for pixel-based sizes uh, is very helpful, but uh, what's great about this is when we convert all this stuff to rims, it becomes very easy ratios. Uh, and th this is a system that requires massaging uh, certain uh, fonts are not sized to be the same height. Uh, they're sized to have been the same block of type when you had metal type. Uh, so this takes some adjusting, uh, but as, as a rule, sticking to these kind of big ratios, uh, jumping up by one rim or one and a half rim, or uh, 0.25 rounds. Uh, making these measured jumps will help us create a rhythm that's very important when we want to create scalable type uh, that's designed to, to work well and responsive, that's designed to work if someone uh, bumps up the screen size, uh, all that type will scale with it. So uh, this is how I, uh, this is one of the great reasons that I use rounds is it allows me to create uh, very simple ratios here. So as I work in building out the style sheet, I always start with H2s and H3s because those are the workhorse headings uh, when dealing with content. H1 happens once, uh, and I tend to think of it more as, a, as an element that's tied in with the header and, and 
tied in with the uh, structure of the site and less so uh, intermingled with the content. Whereas H2s and H3s are, um, they're going to be the things that are in the content, so how that relates to those paragraph blocks is incredibly important. So I'm going to choose Freight Sands uh, as my, my uh, heading font. That'll help give it a little bit of a softer, uh, less formal feel. Uh, and I'm going to develop two different styles with that. Uh, one is a very heavyweight 900. Uh, and then the other one I'm going to make it all caps uh, using text transform. I'm going to space it out a little bit uh, and, you, and leave it as a normal weight. So by creating these two uh, high contrast uh, headings, uh, I, I'm starting to develop that scannability. And I'm giving some different, uh, look, or different presentations that all kind of fit together. So I've, I've created these base, um, base headings. Uh, my next step is line height. Always, again, my, my uh, technique is always font size, then line height, then space things out. Because that line height is, a, is an element that will affect everything after that. So it's important to get that nailed down and then build off of it. One of the things that separates really well done text from really not so well done text is attention to line height on headings. You find this all the time uh, as sites scale down to responsive. It's clear that someone hasn't checked, oh wait, what happens when that wraps? Uh, so one of the things I'll always do is just add a bunch of text so I can make sure it's going to wrap and then uh, set my line height there. So I've made a line height adjustment. Uh, the top is 1.1, uh, the second one is 1.3. And uh, one of the things that, that you will discover is that uh, creating that line height is about creating a, a sort of balance of type. As type gets larger, you need less of, less line height because uh, part of what we're trying to do here is balance the negative space. So you'll also notice that that top one, the black font, um, it is a lot chunkier. It has a lot less negative space. So I'm going to use a lot less line height, 1.1, versus the one that I've spaced out that's, that's uh, a uh, regular weight font. Uh, it has more negative space, so I'm going to use a little bit more line height to uh, to maintain that sort of balance. So the next thing I'm going to do is space those out. Again, this is uh, this is not very uh, appealing. So I'm going to add some space to that. I use margins on everything because margins have a doubling up behavior, uh, which you'll see in just a second. Um, so I've set the line height, which we went over a second ago, and I'm going to use uh, set some margins to space that out, and that creates a system like this. Uh, you'll notice that at the bottom of the P, the one at the bottom is shown, uh, is that two rim spacing that we have. Uh, but the doubling up behavior is that it is going to take the largest unit uh, of spacing, if, you, if they're both uh, margin, it's going to take the largest unit and use that. So <coughs> I've added more spacing above my headings than was below my paragraph. So it's going to use the spacing that is above. So it's going to use that 3.5 rim that I have on the H3 and overlay that with the 2 instead of adding. So that allows us to create some more dependable rhythms uh, than you would if we were always stacking and like, well, what if this is a P and has more spacing than maybe a table or something? Uh, so this allows us a lot more predictability. So then I will usually go back up to that H1 because H1 is really fun. You get to do really big type and crazy stuff with it. Uh, and so I'll usually make the, that's my next step. I've got these workhorse things that I know that I'm going to be using. Uh, and so one of the things that I've found with, with uh, that sort of top-down approach that I mentioned earlier of starting with these big blocks uh, on the homepage is that when you get to uh, this stuff that's really going to be uh, what conveys your content, uh, you've locked in a lot of uh, font choices. And uh, so by building outward like this, uh, we've got all the we've got all the font choices we need to create good content. So now we can build on that and do some fun stuff. So I'm going to use a really big, uh, really big header up there, 4.75 rim. I can make it five or 4.5. It doesn't really matter, but it's sticking with the, that 
type of ratio, uh, I can create something that's really easy uh, for me to deal with. And then I'll flush out uh, the, the lesser headings, uh, H4, H5, and H6. I almost always, actually I always, uh, make H5s and H6 the same thing because I feel like anyone who is using H6 probably has a content pro structure problem. <laughs> so, so usually I'll make, I'll make H5s and H6 the same thing. Uh, but you'll see how in this I've created still different styles. Uh, one of them is, is about the same size as the, as the text, but is chunky and bold. One of them is just bold. Uh, so I'm still creating different ways to display this content to make it very scannable. So the code behind this, uh, you'll notice what, what I talked about earlier about the line height. Uh, since this thing is so big uh, that my H1 and so chunky, I only have a 0.875 line height. I don't need a lot of spacing. Uh, same thing, continuing the uh, the, the uh, H4s. You can see the H5 and H6 are treated the same. Uh, next thing, my next step is uh, ULs and OLs, lists and uh, list items. I assume that's what LI stands for. I don't know, maybe so. Uh, so padding these out, uh, creating styling here. Uh, again, I'm using margin for everything. The one outlier here is that I get really nerdy and add a little bit of padding on those LIs to space out the dots or the numbers because they're a little cramped to me. So uh, this is what that looks like. I'll also set the line height uh, for those list elements a little bit uh, less than the body because you'll find that uh, that if you kind of maintain that body rhythm, a lot of times these will start to look like individual uh, elements, and it will be very difficult to distinguish between spacing between these blocks and spacing within the blocks. Uh, so I usually pull those in a little bit tighter uh, so that they're distinguishable as unique elements. Uh, you'll see here, this is like one building block of an LI. I've got that margin to space it out from the others, and then I got that stupid padding to space out the <coughs> dots and numbers. Uh, that becomes a system that creates all these trays for the content, and then I've margined out uh, around the element itself. And that creates a nice list, man. So <laughs> my next thing is, uh, is tables. Tables are often an afterthought, but they, and I, I came from an era where we used tables to build websites. So table is a four-letter word, in my opinion, but they're very useful uh, as, uh, for tabular data, not for uh, building websites. Uh, but I find that oftentimes you're trying to get a lot of information in these things, so I'm going to go lower on my font size here than the body, uh, because I feel like table content is mostly lean-in content. It's not anything you necessarily need to scan. It's something you're paying close attention to. So we can use a little bit less font size that, that will allow us to get more uh, more content in there. The other thing I've done just for this style uh, is to kind of blow it out a little bit. Uh, I'm going to use uh, a 115% width. Uh, in styling my content, I know that I'm going to have built in padding and gutters uh, around the content to give it some breathable space. But for the table, I'm going to kind of I'm going to extend that out a little bit uh, to allow us to get more uh, more content in there and to break up the content a little bit more. So uh, this is what this looks like. Uh, that border collapse on the table is the coolest thing that's ever happened. Um, when I were, when I was starting off building tables, and especially trying to style tables with CSS, we did a lot of very gross things like put a border on the top and the left, and then put a border on the right and bottom of everything else to create these squares. But the CSS property of border collapse says that we can just put a border on every element, it'll collapse to one or whatever our unit is. Uh, I've chosen one here. So you can see I have the border is actually on the TD. But the, that one and one don't double up, they collapse. So here I've uh, styled a little table coolness. Uh, the, the last thing that I'm going to add here is a block quote. Uh, block quote is an awesome way to sort of break up the text and, uh, and, and break up 
the density of the content, add another visual element that makes things look really purposeful and well designed and kind of magazine-y. Uh, you see a lot of the sites that I mentioned before using blog posts to great effect. It looks wonderful. It's a great thing to include in, uh, in a theme or in a style uh, sheet for a client. Uh, so, styling a little bit of that. Uh, again, the, I know the code is pretty dense here, but uh, all of this is available for download. You can reuse it, do whatever. Uh, the last last thing to consider is link styles. Uh, I have used uh, the content container, whatever your theme or whatever um, you're building off of. The thing that the content is in, I would limit this behavior to that because I've found that if you add this to everything, you're undoing it in places like logos and main nav and all that stuff. Uh, so what this does is set the link behavior, uh, which is a major utility portion of the web, shows links I've gone to, uh, shows that text is a link. Uh, I find that the standard text underline is kind of crude, so I usually don't use that, text decoration none and use a border bottom instead. It has a little bit more space. You can see the Erickson Globe and Termination Shock Zone are both treated that way. Um, that's the way I prefer. Uh, one of the things we can do to get kind of heavily into code, or this is how I use this system. Once I've sort of created uh, a system that works, then I can add variables. I use less, uh, but I can add in these font sizes, colors and stuff like that as variables so that when I reuse this from project to project, really I'm starting with this as a base style guide and then changing these ratios up top, really the font size and line heights, uh, as I sort of massage the, the text to work for the particular content that I'm working with. So to uh, conclude, my, uh, my points are reduce. So by working this way, we can reduce the amount of code that's necessary uh, to create great looking sites because we're working with simple ratios uh, and we're working with content first. Uh, we can, once we've established these great ratios, we can reuse it by creating a base style guide, a uh, kitchen sink style guide that we can reuse from project to project. And we'll find that once we've established these base relationships, base ratios, uh, all of those usually work great for other things like uh, sidebar elements and whatever. We're, we're building on pretty universal principles that we can use throughout the site. So thanks, that's my talk. Uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, the URL at the bottom, uh, Hickok Store is my site and uh, design for content. We'll point you to uh, SlideShare and allow you to download this style guide or see it uh, in action on the web. You can just poke around and, and uh, see what's there. Um, anyway, that's my talk. I think I'm at time or something. Does anyone have any question or if I condensed you up? Yes, ma'am. Uh, you use two kinds of fonts. Yes. What's the advantage of that? Uh, typically, it, a design <coughs> principle is that you want to use different fonts to create that contrast, uh, but you want to limit it to, I usually use no more than two. I find that if I, a lot of times I will use the same font for everything. In this example, I've used two to create that contrast, uh, but usually uh, adding more than two uh, creates clutter and, and you don't really establish a rhythm and a dependability within that. Uh, so, here I'm used to, a lot of times I will use one. Uh, yes. oh. oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, sorry. Um, what, um, uh, this is like uh, with accessibility, with the, like, uh, um, text, is um, what do you do for like uh, people with dyslexia? That is a great question. Uh, one of the reasons that I would use uh, a serif body font is that uh, serifs add to readability. Um, a lot of times you are, when you read, you're actually reading these shapes of words, and serifs usually uh, enhance that. Uh, so for, 
for that, uh, I, I would use the serif to help in that problem a little bit, and that's why I wouldn't really use uh, a sans serif for long body content because those shapes are much less distinguishable and it's a lot harder to read. From what I've read, actually, Comic Sans is a wonderful font for dyslexia, uh, which is, I mean, it's kind of laughable, but, but it works. You know, so. Um, it may, I mean, maybe. Uh, I tend to use uh, a line height that, like I said, if we're reading these shapes of, of words and that aids readability, adding like a, enough line height without it getting distracting helps to separate those shapes um, so that hopefully it does or it should uh, enhance that readability. It's not bulletproof for sure, but um, it should enhance. Um, if you get somebody coming with to you, as I sometimes do, with a sort of a quite text-based logo, I often use a thing online that kind of tries to find the font that is most like that, so I can use that. Is that something that you concern yourself with? Because it, it irritates me to have to use more than two fonts. Yeah. So I try to at least grab theirs if I can, and it's not hideous. Do you do, you do that? Or? I think typically a logo is a little bit of an outlier. Um, if I'm concerned with building that content actually, then the logo is just something that, that sits kind of on top of that. Uh, I will try to find something that relates to it. Okay. I, I usually don't copy a logo or I usually don't uh, pull that font in because typically a font that's great for one line of text is probably not going to be great for um, big chunks of body content, maybe for headings or something. Uh, but usually, usually I try to find something that relates in a way but, but maybe not direct, is directly. Yes? Can you speak at all about what sources of fonts you prefer to use? Sources of fonts. Um, I, I'm a big fan of Typekit. It's super easy to use, and just one of the reasons I work a lot in code has been that until uh, Creative Cloud, it, that was really the only way that you could use the font, uh, use a font that you didn't know. Uh, with desktop syncing for Typekit, it's great because they allow you to uh, download those fonts that you're already paying to use uh, and use them in Photoshop so that I can create models <coughs> for clients and stuff. Uh, but I use a lot of Typekit, uh, Cloud Typography, which is the Hoffler one. They're, the work they've done on web fonts is awesome. Uh, so all their stuff is super high quality. Um, Google fonts can occasionally be wonderful too. Uh, it's with free fonts. A lot of times, there's there are ideas that are 90% there, but are not quite fully baked. Um, so you got to be a little cautious. But yes, yes. Um, excuse me. Uh, I may have missed this point, but if will, if you change your font family, do you need to change all the ratios to redo those, or? Yes. So typically, when I would, if I would take that style sheet that I just showed. I would start with the fonts, so because every one of them is going to have different negative space and different actual height. Uh, so I would start with that, and then and then massage those ratios to where they work with the actual typeface that I showed. Excellent. Okay. Thanks. Yep. personal blog was one of the first ones that I saw that was like taking the idea of a tablet and making a desktop site. And it was like ridiculous, like 21 point text or something. It was huge. Uh, and a lot of people found that really off-putting. It's like, I can't read this. And I think a lot of it is is that we learned to read very small text and that's what we expect. Uh, I think it's wonderful. And I keep blowing up mine a little, you know. I use 18 as a pre as a base on most stuff that's kind of long for <laughs> I get up there too. Uh, yes. Um, and, and but yeah, the bigger the better to me. I think it's a wonderful reading experience as we get older. Yeah. <laughs> Here's that. Yes. Do you change the font based on the target audience? So. Yes, absolutely. Because you know, do you change it for kids or do you change it for seniors? I am working on a senior website right now, and what's readable for me 
it may not be, you know, readable for them. Right. You know, that's where uh, one of the things that are, or step one is like finding the voice that you want. And that is, who's the target audience? What are their expectations? What are their limitations sometimes? Uh, if, it's a, if it's kids, uh, then that limitation may be uh, they're, they're used to certain more elementary letter shapes or something. Uh, it's a consideration that I've had to, I've had to take in. Uh, or, or for kids, uh, you may decide that really their parents are the ones that are doing, you know, they're on the site, so it needs to feel like a kid's site, but be geared towards the parents. So there's a lot of things that uh, you take into consideration find a font that uh, that matches that expectation, uh, but help. Is there any good website uh, what related to this? So I can, you know, read a little bit about what good font for this kind of audience, or it just based on our experience? There's probably a lot of great blog work on that. Um, there are a few sites dedicated to sort of showing you and dissecting what fonts are used, like in popular things, like on websites or whatever. Uh, fonts in use is a good one. TypeWolf does a good job of that. Uh, TypeKit has just started like a learning kind of blog that does a lot of, uh, well, does a lot. I think they want to do a lot. It's incredibly thorough. Um, but hopefully they will do a lot more of that uh, sort of explaining type and how to use it. Uh, but I would just search the web. I don't know of any formal ones for, for mm -hmm. that particular uh, piece of knowledge. Okay. We have time for one more. All right, one more. Oh, yes. Have you played around with um, typecast? You know, I started to and then I didn't. It was just one of those things where like, it solved a problem for me, but it solved a problem that I, fig I had kind of already figured out a workaround for. Uh, and so I just didn't, I just didn't use it. Like if I design in code, which is what I was doing at the time, a lot more, then I already, like once I've made those decisions, I already have code that I can start re reusing to build a site. Um, so th that way just became more efficient for me. And then once desktop integration happened with TypeKit, which I use a lot, then it became less of a open necessity. All right, well I guess that's me.